Here we start the first section with mortgage math. Without question, a knowledge of numbers and how to calculate them is the most important skill a loan officer can possess. After all, it's a numbers business. For those of you who have some fluency with financial calculations and math, this section will be remedial. But many of us didn't like math in high school and we don't like it now. Having a practical application that is a need to actually do the work to do the job can help us overcome our fears of math. The second part of this lesson will deal with financial calculations. It is our hope that you will become a master of financial calculations. That's why we deal with the math first. Without this ability, you can't really be a loan officer. As loan officers, our primary objective is to get loans. After all, that's what we get paid for. There is a tremendous amount of pressure to originate. Commission-only salespeople are incredibly competitive. Without a system of working with borrowers, it's difficult to understand how to get a borrower to apply with us. Without some sort of a system, we resort to other sales tactics we may have learned in other lines of work, such as developing rapport by talking about the weather or family or sports or other hobbies as an attempt to develop a relationship with a borrower. Worse, however, is the loan officer who resorts to using price or bait-and-switch tactics in order to obtain a borrower's agreement to apply. That's why our objective in this course is to help you understand the concepts underlying financial calculations. We use borrower education, that is, the process of helping a borrower understand the financial aspect of the transaction as a tool for getting the loan. Borrowers are afraid to ask if they don't understand something. If you educate a borrower, you will develop more trust and that borrower will be more willing to apply with you. Borrower education is a closing tool. As we mentioned, Section 1 deals with mortgage math. We've broken it into these components. Obviously, understanding how we communicate numbers in speaking in decimals and fractions. Understanding points, the different business forms, reading a rate sheet, how to quote interest rates. Moving on to financial calculations, using a financial calculator to do the math. Understanding ratios from a qualifying perspective and from a guideline perspective. And finally, how to use pre-qualification as a tool for closing a borrower. When we start talking about how we, in the mortgage business, communicate numbers, it's comical to note that we have a language of our own. We jokingly call this language mortgagees. One of the first things you'll notice as you work in an office is that we talk numbers differently. We speak about interest rates and points verbally as we're talking to each other in fractions. However, in writing, we almost never see fractions. We see numbers expressed in decimals. Can you convert these fractions to decimals? Do you think a borrower can convert fractions to decimals? In fact, when we start talking about interest rates and we speak in fractions, we're almost immediately going to lose the borrower. They don't understand what we are saying. Here you see the decimal equivalent of common fractions. 1 eighth is 0.125, 1 quarter, 0.25, 3 eighths, 0.375.
a half is 0 0.5, 5 eighths, 0 0.625, 3 quarters, 0 0.75, 7 eighths is 0 0.875. If you have a hard time remembering what the fraction represents, simply divide the top number by the bottom number on your calculator. That will give you the decimal equivalent. I just mentioned that if we start talking in fractions to the borrower, the borrower may hear something else than what we intend them to. The most ready example of this we see all the time. When a borrower hears 5 eighths, what do you think? Is it 0.58? Or would you think 0.6? Or 0.625? If you hear 7 eighths, do you think 0.7? Or 0.78? Well, you probably don't think 0.875, which is what the equivalent actually is, we would encourage you to get in the habit of saying the decimal equivalent of the fraction, since that's how the customer will see it in writing. Remember, borrowers are afraid of sounding stupid. If they show ignorance, they think that they'll be taken advantage of. And that may not be such an unreasonable concern on the part of the borrower many lenders do take advantage of ignorant borrowers. But think about it. If the first conversation you have with a borrower leaves them unsure, are you really building a foundation for trust? If that borrower does not trust you, do you really think they're going to be comfortable in submitting an application? Don't assume that the borrower understands. Always ask for clarification. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is just an example of it, but we'll continue this process of explaining to a borrower, confirming the borrower's understanding, before we move on. We love jargon. The only industry that has more jargon than the mortgage industry is the armed services. We get so used to speaking in jargon that we forget that not everyone understands what we're talking about. We also like to use jargon if we're inexperienced because it makes us feel like we're insiders that we know what we're talking about. To an uneducated borrower, the lingo of the business makes no sense. He or she may feel that they don't know something maybe they should. A borrower will not ask for clarification. And this is when we start to lose them. Speak in plain English. If you use jargon because you want to sound like you know what you're talking about, that's fine. Explain what it means. Some loan officers say, well, if I explain everything I'm talking about, I'm going to be on the phone for hours. A good comeback for that is, is that a problem? The more time we spend with a borrower on the phone, the less time they're going to spend speaking with other lenders. Instead of talking about the weather or current events, we can talk about something that really matters to them, their mortgage process. Even as new loan officers, we have a sensitivity to what the borrower might be going through in terms of lingo and jargon. There are so many acronyms. For instance, GFE stands for Good Faith Estimate, a Closing Cost Estimate. TIL or TIL stands for Truth in Lending, which is a disclosure giving the APR. 1003, we love to joke about this because we can always tell who the brand new loan officer is because he says that he wants to learn how to fill out the 1003 form. If you've been in the business any length of time, you know that we call it a 1003, not a 1003 form. RESPA stands for the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, which governs the good faith estimate, among other things, and YSP stands for Yield Spread Premium, 
which is above par pricing. Remember, you now know what these things mean, but the borrower does not. Always stop, confirm the borrower's understanding before progressing.